Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. One way of achieving that mission is listening to experts discuss pressing local, national, and international issues. Before COVID struck, Concerned Citizens met regularly to hear these experts. After COVID arrived, Concerned Citizens turned to Zoom, video recording talks, panels, and debates for later broadcast on this channel. Now that COVID is in remission, our main menu is again in-person meetings. But for those of you unable to join us, Village TV is video recording our in-person speakers for later broadcast on this program. In addition, when the right opportunity comes along, Concerned Citizens Presents will continue to offer the occasional remote speaker. We hope you enjoy today's program. I am here today, like you, Piper, but to introduce Patty Carell. We had Patty's schedule back in Women's History Month in March, and a glitch undid it. Um, so, but she hung on, she hung on. Patty has had a whole lot. We've known Patty, my wife Sue and I have known Patty and Jim for well over 20 years. In fact, we were even at their wedding 20 years ago. 20 years ago, like yesterday or the day before. <laughs> and Patty is for a long time, she's a Southern California girl, but a long time had this passion for helping people, especially young girls. And she has a good program going uh, with free admission for a, a program help young girls become comfortable with themselves to realize that they are perfect the way they are. Um, um, she married uh, one of our top Orange County spiritual leaders back then, 20 years ago, and I'm sure that's helped her along on her, on her journey. Um, Patty would like to share today about one of the things, the making of her story. Now, you've all heard of history, right? His story? Well, she's going to talk about her story. She'll tell us things about women that most of us, at least most of us men, have never even heard of. Um, she's, she's fabulous, she's lovely, and I'm excited to hear. Okay, I was walking down the hall here, and um, you've got a lot of clubs here. How exciting, how fun. I think I want to live here. Um, and I want to also introduce my husband, Jim Terrell, who's here, my lovely assistant today. And he'll be, he'll be interjecting some of his own thoughts along the way. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I am not a teacher, historian, or author. I am a very curious activist that is passionate about women's causes and women's history. And uh, that curiosity led me 20 years ago to where I am today. Uh, I'm the founder and president of the Women's Journey Foundation. And our organization, not only am I celebrating my 20th anniversary, I'm also celebrating Women's Journey Foundation anniversary. We're, we've been around for 20 years also. So it's uh, very exciting, yes. So that 20 years ago, uh, my curiosity um, kind of woke me up because I realized how much I did not know about women's history. And I have to say I was a little embarrassed by that. And then I also questioned the fact that, well, Maybe I didn't pay attention in school, or maybe they didn't teach this information in school. And as it turns out, there's about 3 to 5% of educational materials that include women. And that depends on what state you live in. Now, when I grew up in the 70s, it's probably even less than that. We heard about the suffragettes. We heard about Harriet Tubman and other great women first. But they didn't go into too much more than that, OK? So uh, in 3,500 years, this is even an even more stark number. In 3,500 years of written world history, can you guess at the percentage that women are represented by? Anybody know? 0.5, yes, one half of 1%. Isn't that crazy? So you know, um, we, what I've noticed, especially through the years, is that we really do not have a historic lineage, or the history is incomplete because we don't include enough women. And because we have a, self, a free self-esteem program, we see the direct correlation of a girl's lack of self-esteem 
or partly thereof, of her lack of knowledge about women in history. So what if? What if more girls knew about women in history? Wouldn't that sort of kind of give them an idea of what's possible, right? Thank you. Uh, my favorite quote is by Mary Sadker, and this sort of just encapsulates everything I want to talk about today. Um, whenever a girl picks up a book and reads a womanless history, she learns that she is worthless. And my question to you is, what about boys? What about boys reading the same history books where they don't see the women? Were women less significant? Were their achievements and contributions meaningless? So that's why I'm so passionate about this, because I want young people to know who these great women were. Their contributions and achievements helped in the formation of our country and the further development of it. We know that, right? Um, I, I, I have to tell you a funny, something kind of funny, because I had this notion in my head that we were going to get a bunch of signatures. We were going to go to Sacramento, and we were going to talk to the State Board of Education and demand that they put more women's history into the history books. And then we realized that it's going to be an uphill battle. And we weren't prepared for that. And we thought, instead, why don't we create tangibles where we can help girls and boys learn about women in history by interactive, fun activities. Um, so those tangibles are quizzes. And you, I think you all got one before you walked in the door. If you didn't, they're, they're in the back. I encourage you to try to uh, see how, much, how many of these women that you know. Um, some of the most learned women uh, in women's studies didn't get 100% on that. I'm not sure, but did everybody get no? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, sure. I'll give you a moment. I'll keep talking. Um, so we have these, by the way, we have these books. Uh, so as you leave, please take one. They're free. Uh, the Women's Journey Foundation is mentioned in one of these chapters. Um, it's written by a friend of mine by the name of uh, Shelley Rationale. And the book is called When Women Run the World, Shit Gets Done. Right? Great title. And then for the quizzes later on, if you want the key, if you want the answers. Hello? Can I turn this thing off? No, it's still on. Hello, hello. There we go. In the cradle. All right. There we go. Good? Okay. All right. Um, so the tangibles were quizzes and flashcards, and we have flashcards in the back for $20 as well. And what we also decided to do six years ago was to create productions called Making Her Story. And these productions were really popular. We honored women of today who are paving the way for future generations. And in 2020, just before the shutdown, we had our last live performance of Making Her Story, at least for now. And, um, and we had Dolores Huerta come and accept the, the Lifetime Legacy Award. I loved meeting her. She's fantastic. She reminded me of a story uh, that she had is about uh, meeting Barack Obama for the first time. And she told him, she said, you know, Chavez did not come up with that statement, si se puede. That was mine. I coined that phrase. But, right? OK. A lot of people don't know that. I didn't know that. Um, and then fast forward to 2021, we realized that we could not do an in-person uh, performance, so we decided to film it instead. This took three days and five days to edit. How much it cost? Uh, I won't say that. <laughs> it, it was about twenty-seven thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, but we felt it was so important. We did raise the money for it, and we're super, super proud of this production. And uh, I'll tell you after Jim's going to show you a quick little five-minute trailer, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Tonight, we shall hear oral arguments, testimonies, from women throughout history. You're an aeronaut? An astronaut, Miss Fly. Not balloons, rockets, space, the moon. But then, you exit the atmosphere. The main engine shut off, and suddenly, there's no gravity. I taught the computer how to understand English. 
back in the hot seat again. <laughs> Tennis was a privileged sport, a rich sport, a white sport. The ones playing were the ones who had access to the tennis clubs. So I found my way around that <laughs> by sneaking onto the courts at night. Position one, in which I am born of two worlds. They said, Dolores, no se puede. But I said, si, si se puede. Yes, we can. Nellie Blyes raced around the world. I didn't see anyone in the suffrage movement who looked like me. I was determined that I was going to help others register to vote. We are not perfect, nor are we in union when equality falters. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Isn't that great? Yeah, we, we had to be very careful. We had to schedule the actors in at different intervals because, you know, we were in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, on March 12th, we aired this online. And we thought, surely it will go national, and it did. But what we, what we didn't expect was it went international. It was shown to people in seven different countries from the United States to Saudi Arabia. So we're really proud of that. And um, we plan on making more of these because they're really good for schools. And of course, we, we have other events that we could uh, air these at. But uh, we feel that you know when they see these type of women portraying these roles, you know, and we, usually we have young girls involved in that portraying the roles of, of women as well. So that builds their confidence, and it really it really is such a great uh, joy to see um, what these girls are experiencing when they're rehearsing and when they embrace these roles of the women who came before them. Uh, so. Um, no further ado, I'm going to have Jim start the slideshow. And I'm going to read a lot to you so we can get through this. Otherwise, we will be here for hours because there's so many women to cover. And I didn't, it, had, it was very hard for me to choose who to start with. Um, but we'll start with um, the Revolutionary War. And I broke this up in, I broke all these women up into war times because things did change a lot during the war. You want to go back up? Is that the first one? No, you're going to go all the way. There you go. Yep. OK. And the second slide, please. OK. The Revolutionary War. Uh, the women who were in the Revolution War, Revolutionary War, they did a lot of things. Um, where they were actually referred to as camp followers. They would follow the soldiers from each battle. Um, camp followers often tended to the domestic side of army organization, washing, cooking, mending clothes, and providing medical help when necessary. Sometimes women disguised themselves as men to fight in the battles. Other times they served as spies. Who knew that? I didn't know that. Okay. On the, on the home front, there were businesses, homesteads, families, and properties to look after. The women were largely responsible for keeping the economy going during the war. Women managed the harvesting and selling crops and maintained and promoted business. And this is all during a time when women, there was no public education for women, women could not own businesses, and married women could not own properties. Did anyone know that? If you were single, you could own property. Once you got married, that was transferred to the man. Isn't that interesting? Okay, next slide, please. Abigail Adams. Uh, now, Jim is a huge fan of Abigail, so I'll have him tell you a little bit about Abby. Uh, Abigail Adams uh, <clears throat> was married to John Adams, of course. But when John was in uh, France trying to negotiate with the French to support the Revolutionary War, she went over twice to see him. And the, uh, both times that she went over, she was so interested in what the ship was like and how it ran. But the, the both captains of both ships said she could have sailed the ship herself. <laughs> That's how smart she was. She was also in charge of all the finances and everything at home, although it was against the law for her to do that. Her uncle helped her. And one time, uh, uh, 
Adams, John Adams, all people, wrote a letter to her and said, I found out about a thousand acres in Vermont. And, and by the way, during the Revolutionary War, it was a boom and bust, just like it is now, with real estate. So he said, but I need a loan to buy the property. And so she looked around, wrote back to him, said, I can't find anybody. Then she finally wrote, said, I found somebody who loaned me the money. And he said, who is it? She said, it's me. <laughs> so she actually loaned him the money at a percentage of her interest and everything. So she yeah. was an extraordinarily uh, talented woman. Yes. And I love this quote by Abigail. She wrote a letter to the newly formed Continental Congress and said, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Pretty smart gal, right? Um, and by the way, Abigail was also a huge advocate for, for public education for women. Next slide, please. This gal's name is Mercy Otis Warren. She was a gifted playwright, poet, and historian, as well as a revolutionary woman who symbolized and promoted the ideas and principles upon which the United States was established during the American Revolution. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, this, this is an interesting character. Okay, so Paul Revere was not the only one who rode through the night to warn the colonists of the, of the approaching British troops, right? This gal's name is Sybil Luddington. Not only did she ride through the night, she rode twice as far and in the pouring down rain. And if you ever happen to be in Virginia, they have a statue named after her. Next, next slide, please. Fast forward to the Civil War. Women worked in a variety of capacities, from cooking to nursing to actually fighting on the front lines. They planted gardens, canned food, cooked, sewed uniforms, blankets, and socks. Working class white women and African American women worked as laundresses, cooks, and matrons. Next slide, please. They also disguised themselves as men to fight along the front lines. In fact, over 400 women did that. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Next slide. Do we all know who she is? American Red Cross, right? She bravely provided nursing care and supplies to soldiers and earned the nickname Angel of the Battlefield. When the war ended, Claire, Clara contacted President Lincoln to open the office of missing soldiers. She, re she reconnected over 20,000 soldiers with her families. Isn't that something? Okay, and then next slide, please. Louisa May Alcott, and this is another favorite of Jim's, so take it away, Jim. So Louisa May was famous for being a nurse in the Washington area, Washington, D.C., and she got sick early on in that experience because they started putting, treating her with mercury. I don't know if you know that that was a popular thing to do, not a good thing to do, because once mercury got into your system, it never left. So she, uh, you know, kind of like had to go off and recover, and that's when she started writing articles and got famous, and then she wrote, of course, Little Women, and it made her into a rock star, literally a rock star. And not only made her a ton of money, she became so famous, and her father, Bronson Alcott, who lived in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, uh, they, people would come to the house just unannounced and want us to talk to her, and so she didn't like this, so Bronson would talk for her. But when Bronson got older and he was dying, he, uh, he called her from Boston to visit him. And he asked her to go with him, meaning die when I die. And she said, I can't do that. She went home. She died 24 hours later. Wow. So it's an odd case of uh, interesting uh, circumstances. And, um, and she also was a feminist and abolitionist. And she fought her entire life for women's suffrage. Uh, next slide, please. Lucy Stone, uh, have any, has anyone heard of Lucy Stone? Fabulous woman. Uh, she was a pioneer in the movement for women's rights. She lectured against slavery and advocated equality for women. Famous for becoming the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree. She helped to organize the Seneca Falls Convention. This is where it all began for the suffrage movement. And this, you know, the suffrage movement, I love the stories behind the scenes. Seneca Falls, 
triggered a huge uh, uh, influx of, of feminism at that time. Um, and this is all done, though. It was all started in someone's house sipping tea, right? And it was, I, think, I just love that. We've, we reenacted that tea party, actually, one time. Um, the, the thing about Lucy and other suffragettes is they picketed the front of the White House. That's all they did. And they were arrested. And they were jailed in deplorable conditions. They were tortured. They were force-fed. And I can go on and on. Um, but uh, she, you know the fact that they had to go through all of that just because they wanted the right to vote, it's just mind-boggling. And I often wonder, too, about suffragettes. A lot of them put everything on the line. They risked everything, their reputations, their families. And why? Why would they continue to put everything on the line? I have to believe it's because they wanted more for future generations. So thank you, suffragettes. Um, my husband Jim and I went on a historic tour last year. Uh, we went to some of the best museums in Washington, D.C., Virginia, New York. Um, where else did we go? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a great town. And uh, we, we were so inspired. And in Virginia, there is a Lucy Stone Museum. And there's the Algonquin Workhouse where they were held. And it's pretty tough. When you go there, it's a very solemn feeling because you're actually witnessing what took place. It's, it's pretty, pretty uh, incredible. Uh, next slide, please. This is Elizabeth Blackwell. She was the first woman physician in the United States. She organized the Women's Central Association of Relief during the Civil War. Next slide. She trained nurses for the war service. Elizabeth played an important role in developing the United States Sanitary Commission. Next slide, please. World War I, things started changing pretty dramatically. Women served as stenographers, clerks, radio operators, messengers, truck drivers, ordinance workers, mechanics, and all of their non-combat duties. Next slide. The US Navy was shorthanded. You're going to love this story because I loved it. The US Navy was shorthanded at the beginning of World War I. Vague wording in a section of the Naval Act of 1916 outlining who could serve created a loophole allowing women to join the ranks as yeoman. Jim, what does yeoman mean again? Secretarial services. Secretarial services. Around 12,000 women enlisted in the Navy under that title. 12,000. <coughs> Next slide. Aiming to improve communications on the Western Front between the Allied forces, women who were bilingual in French and English were asked to serve as telephone switchboard operators. The women received physical training, observed strict military protocol, and worked very close to the front lines. These female recruits were named Hello Girls and became known for their bravery and focus under pressure. Of course, women are good at that, aren't they? Uh, however, upon their return to the United States after the end of the war, the Hello Girls did not receive any pay, veteran status, or benefits. It wasn't until 1977 that Jimmy Carter awarded those who were still alive pensions. Isn't that something? Um, next slide, please. Hello Girl, Grace Banker, worked near the battlefields of France, often with shells falling all around her. Grace led a group of 33 women who connected critical calls between Allied forces. The Hello Girls were connecting 150,000 calls a day. After the war, Banker was given a Distinguished Service Medal. Next slide. Ah, Jeanette Rankin. This one was a spitfire. Uh, she was elected to Congress, um, and uh, it was all based on a bet, and she won the bet. <laughs> so, um, so she was uh, a women's rights advocate, the first woman to hold a federal office in the United States. She was elected in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, from Montana in 1916 and again in 1941. As of 2022, Rankin is still the only woman ever elected to Congress from Montana. I think they've got some work to do. Um, she was a lifelong, lifelong pacifist. She voted against World War I and World War II. And even after she left office, she actually uh, worked on the, on, um, the, the campaign against the, the Vietnam War. 
um, to see. She also introduced legislation that became the 19th Constitutional Amendment. She championed many diverse women's rights and civil rights causes for more than six decades. She worked to expand voting rights for women to ensure better working conditions for laborers across America and to improve health care for women and infants. Ultimately, she was the pathbreaker. Her famous words were, I may be the first woman in Congress, but I will not be the last. Next slide, please. World War II. Uh, American women played important roles during World War II, both at home and in uniform. Not only did they give of their sons, their brothers, their husbands, they also gave of their time and energy. Um, next slide. Nearly 350,000 American women served in uniform, both at home and abroad, volunteering for the newly formed Women's Army Corps, the Navy Women's Reserve, and Coast Guard, and the Navy Nurse Corps. Next slide. And the Women Air Force Service Pilots, known as WASPs. General Eisenhower felt that he could not win the war without the aid of women in uniform. Next slide, please. We all know this gal. We've seen that picture many times. I always thought it was a person, when actually this symbol represented all the women workers for the cause, for the war cause. Um, what's really interesting is that Norman Rockwell created this image. Um, and he did it for the Saturday Evening Post, which was uh, shown on May 29, 1943. The illustration initially had no connection with someone named Rosie. The campaign, We Can Do It, was part of the national campaign in the US to enlist women in the workforce. I had the um, unmistakable pleasure to meet one of the last Rosie the Riveters. Her name was Eleanor Otto. She worked for Boeing for 49 years. They let her go six months before her 50th year, which I thought, well, that's kind of silly. They could have done, you know, done a lot of PR on that and you know, got some recognition for her. Um, I think six months after she retired, she passed away. But uh, what an incredible, I asked her, um, she worked with a lot of younger people in those 49 years, and I asked her what uh, advice she could give the younger ge generation. She says, work hard. Um, let's see here. And then we have next slide. Uh, now this is someone that I just found out about probably a year ago. Her name is Frances Perkins. Do you know who she is? Great lady. Um, it's, it's amazing, she was famous for becoming the first woman cabinet member under the Roosevelt administration. But here, here's her legacy. Uh, she was largely responsible for the creation of Social Security. Thank you, Frances. <laughs> Unemployment insurance. And the United States, the, uh, the federal minimum wage, she was responsible for that. And the federal laws reg uh, regulating child labor. And in Washington, D.C., she has a huge building named after her. Next slide, please. Hedy Lamar, beautiful woman. Very, very smart woman. Uh, she patented an idea that later became uh, secure military communications, or what we know today as GPS, and mobile phone, te mobile phone technology. The original idea meant to solve the problem of enemies blocking signals from radio-controlled missiles during World War II. Hetty's idea was very important to both the military and the cell phone industry. Uh, Hetty received no credit, no compensation, and she died penniless. You should know, too, that Hetty, uh, yeah, wherever she went, she had a, I mean, a laboratory where she worked when she wasn't on screen. She was a dedicated scientist. Next slide, please. You saw Grace Hopper in the, in the trailer. Uh, she, the easiest way I could say this is that she talked to computers, and she was really good at it, and she was the earliest computer programmer and leader in software development concepts. Uh, Althea Gibson also was in the trailer. Um, she, was an, um, she was an American tennis player and professional golfer, and one of the first black athletes to cross the color line of international tennis. In 1956, she became the first African-American to win a Grand Slam title. 
The following year, she won both Wimbledon and then won both again in 1958 and was voted Female Athlete of the Year by the Associated Press in both years. She had to sneak onto the tennis court at night because African-American women, African-Americans period, were not allowed onto white courts. We have some work to do in this country, don't we? <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Now, I grew up watching reruns of I Love Lucy. I thought she was hilarious. Um, Lucy, what a story. I love sharing backstories. Uh, she was nominated for 13 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning five times, and was the recipient of several other accolades, such as the Cecil B. DeMille Award, and two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Lucy was the first woman, and you may not know this, the first woman to own and produce her own studio, okay? She produced I Love Lucy, The Lucy Show, The Untouchables, Mission Impossible, and get this, she also produced Star Trek. And it wasn't until, 19, until 1962, Desi Lu, that was the name of the, the production studio, was the second largest independent television production company in the United States. Okay, so here's a backstory about Star Trek. It was being pitched to a lot of different studios. They all rejected it. They couldn't get their mind around a spaceship flying through space <laughs> on a frontier, you know. Um, and so uh, she took it up. Now, we know the huge success of Star Trek, right? Here's what you need to know. Star Trek had nine spin-off television series and a film franchise and a wide range of spin-offs including games, figurines, novels, toys, and comics. Star Trek is noted for its cultural influence beyond works of science fiction. The franchise is also noted for its progressive civil rights stances the original series included one of the first multiracial casts on US television. So I think Lucy did okay by that. Okay, uh, next slide please. Uh, Dr. Chen Shen Wu was a Chinese American particle and experimental physicist who made significant contributions in the fields of nuclear and particle physics. Wu worked on the Manhattan Project where she helped develop the process for separating uranium by gaseous diffusion. Uh, in 1957, her male colleagues won the Nobel, Pre Nobel Prize for Wu's contribution. She never received acknowledgement for her groundbreaking work. Uh, next slide. Okay, enter the Vietnam War. Women in the Vietnam War served as soldiers, health workers, and in news gathering capacities. Though relatively little official data exists about women, female uh, Vietnam War veterans, um, the, the Vietnams, uh, I think they approximately guessed that it was 11,000 military women were stationed in Vietnam during the conflict. That's a lot of women. Um, so next slide. Nearly all of them were volunteers. I did not know that. Uh, and 90% served as military nurses, so women also worked as physicians, air traffic controllers, intelligence officers, clerks at other positions in the U.S. Army. They also were in the Navy, Air Force, and Marines. In Washington, D.C., there's this, at the Vietnam um, Memorial, there's this beautiful statue that I was, I was emotional about, and it was um, three nurses, might have been four, and each one of them is holding a soldier in her arms. It's beautiful. If you're ever there, I would definitely recommend seeing it. Um, the next slide, please. This is Catherine Graham. We all know who Catherine Graham is? Yep. Okay. Um, she took over the leadership of the Washington Company in 1972 and became the first woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Under her leadership, of course, we all know that they exposed the, the uh, Watergate scandal. Next slide, please. Fannie Lou Hamer's also in our trailer there. Uh, she was an American voting and she was an uh, American voting and women's rights activist. Computing, uh, she did that and computer software. She did community organizing. She was the leader of the civil rights movement and the co-founder and vice chair of the Freedom Democratic Party, which she represented at the 1964 National Convention. She. Um, 
there was a lot of threats against her life. She was really, um, it was too bad because they, they, they caused her a lot of pain and harm. Okay, next slide. My favorite female artist, Aretha Franklin. I'm gonna give you the backstory. We all know that she was a great singer, right? What you may not know is she was the first woman inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She held the record for Billboard Hot 100 singles by a woman for 40 years. She earned degrees in honorary doctorates in music from Princeton University, Yale University, Berklee College of Music, New England Conservatory of Music, and University of Michigan. Franklin was immersed and involved in the struggle for civil rights and women's rights. She provided money for civil rights groups, at times covering payroll, and performed at benefits and protests. Franklin also championed causes like health care access, environmental protection, and disability rights. What a great lady. Next slide. Billie Jean King. Uh, now, I was a young girl when there was the Battle of the Sexes, um, but I thought that was pretty cool at the time. I just thought that. I still think that's neat. Um, she ranked number one in the world in women's tennis for five years. Between 1961 and 1979, Billie Jean won a record of 20 Wimbledon titles, 13 United States titles, four French titles, two Australian titles for a total of 39 Grand Slam titles. Not too bad for a career. Um, off the court, Billie Jean campaigned and lobbied for equal pride, I'm sorry, prize money in the men's and women's games. In 1970, she joined the Virginia Slims Tour for women, and in 1971, King became the first woman athlete to earn $100,000 prize money. Unfortunately, um, when she won the U.S. Open in 1972, although she received a great deal of money, she received $15,000 less than her male counterpart. And then back, Battle of the Sexes, uh, Billie Jean beat Bobby Riggs 6-4, 6-3, No tennis match before or since has ever been seen by so many. Um, next slide. Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, she broke new ground for women in the legal field when she was sworn in as the first female justice on the Supreme Court. I am a big fan of hers because she supported Roe v. Wade for so long. Um, she was very conservative in her outlook on politically, but she always ruled um, on what was, she thought was best for the Constitution, to support the Constitution. And she also developed an online civics game for children. So, People could learn about politics and be, it was, she developed a program where it was very interactive and fun. Next slide, please. On June 18th in 1983, flying on the Space Shuttle Challenger, Sally Ride was the first American woman in space. Next slide. Carolyn Shoemaker never set out to be a scientist, but after th her three children were grown, she wanted something new to do. Talk about reinventing yourself. Uh, so at the age of 51, she started a second career and became a world-renowned astronomer. She is the holder of the record for the most comet discoveries. And of course, we have going into, next slide, please. Uh, we're going into now the 20th and 21st century, and I'm just gonna quickly go down the list. I know you know a lot of these gals, but I thought they deserved recognition. Um, go ahead, Geraldine Ferrara. First female vice presidential candidate. Next slide. Catherine Sullivan, first American woman to walk in space. Next slide. Penny Marshall, first woman film director whose film earned more than 100 million at the box office. Does anyone know what movie that was? Uh, no. no. Nope. A League of Their Own, about the women baseball players. Yes. Uh, next slide. Antonia Novella, first woman to be named Surgeon General of the U.S. Next slide. May Carol Jemison, first African-American woman in space. Next one. 
Ah, she's one of my favorites, Maya Angela. Jim and I saw her at UCLA, and just you could just I just fell in love with her voice. <laughs> she's just such an amazing poet. Uh, but she was the first female poet to read a poem at the presidential inauguration. Next slide. Claudia Kennedy, first female U.S. Army three-star general. Next slide. Eileen Collins, first woman astronaut to command a space shuttle mission. Next slide. Hillary Rodden Clinton, first former first lady ever elected to a national office, and she did so much more than that. Uh, next slide. Anne Dunwoody, I hope I didn't mispronounce that. She was the first woman four-star general in the United States military. Next slide. Catherine Bigelow, first woman to win the Oscar for Best Director in 2010. Does anyone know which movie that was? Yes, Hurt Locker. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, I think, what was, what was that movie? The, it was the Avatar, right. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is something that's exciting. We're making progress, people. Um, Katie Sowers, first woman and first openly gay coach in the Super Bowl industry. Pretty cool. Uh, and then last but not least, Kamala Harris. And we all know what her contribution is. Um, so that's, that's all I have as far as, and there, there's hundreds and hundreds of more women. Um, it was, like I said, it was tough to, determine who to choose and, and do it in a short period of time. Um, I wanted to share with you that there's another project that the Women's Journey Foundation is working on, and we're very excited about this, and uh, there's a lot of people very interested in it, and it doesn't surprise me. We're calling it the Women's Legacy Project. What we want to do in three to five years is build a women's history museum here in Orange County. And in that museum, it will also be a learning center, so young girls and boys can go and learn about who these women were. But here's the, here's the difference between um, this museum and what, um, and what other museums, museums are doing. We want them to be interactive. We want every exhibit to be interactive, fun, and engaging. So we're gonna use um, uh, VR, we're gonna use AR, we're gonna use um, holograms, so they'll be touching and feeling and getting onto the screens, and they'll be testing their ability to, to know who these women were. Um, they'll also be enacting certain roles as women. Um, and that, that's pretty much, I won't go into too much, but um, we, we've been working on this for the past year, and uh, we're very excited about this project. Now, you all know probably that they're building a women's history museum in D.C. at the Smithsonian but that's 10 years down the road. So we have something, and we do pop-ups every year. Um, and this next year, we're going to be going to the Heroes Hall at the Orange County Fairgrounds to perform Making Her Story, Celebrating Women in Military History. And then we also later in the year plan on doing a concert and performance, Making Her Story, Celebrating Women in Music History. So it'll be very interesting. Um, my role today was not to educate you. I'm sure there's some of you in this audience that know far more than I do. What I was hoping to do was to inspire you to be curious, to do your research, and share the stories that you find with other women, and especially young girls. Um, and I'm going to leave you with the final quote that I absolutely love. If we want our girls to benefit from the courage and the wisdom of the women before them, we have to share their stories. History must tell the whole story. So we have our work cut out for us, but I think Everything is possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Patty, can you describe yeah. one of the days of your self esteem workshops with young girls? Yes. When we were there, I know at some time when you were doing it, and saw how happy the girls were, and you were so happy. Yes. Describe it a little bit, a day with your self esteem. Yes, uh, we invite role models to come and talk to the girls about maybe uh, pursuing a career in that field. Um, we also develop workshops on our own um, that help the girls 
get in touch with themselves in a way where they discover their talents and strengths. When they discover their talents and strengths, what we've learned is they're more confident afterwards. Um, I'll tell you a quick little story. This is one of the things that we do at the, at the conference for the girls. Uh, I started noticing the girls, because I was one of these girls, very shy. Um, and they weren't acclimating very well with the other girls and with the program. So we, you know, we grew concerned about that. So I decided to bring in a puppy pen, OK? So there's actually such a thing where they'll bring the puppies and a pen. And so what I would do is I'd find the girls that were really shy and say, I need some help with the puppies outside. Would you mind helping me? And so they would follow me out. And I tell you, 10 or 15 minutes holding a puppy made all the difference in the world. And this is a funny story. So there was a t two or three girls that I was really trying to get into this puppy pen. Finally got them in, couldn't get them out. Uh, so I, I walked away for maybe five minutes, and then I came back. I thought, oh, no, they've disappeared. <laughs> When I walked back into the auditorium where the, all the activities were taking place, they were up there doing bali dancing with the bali dancers. <laughs> so, you know, puppies can do a lot, right, to build self-esteem. Yes. Oh, I, I thought this was a wonderful presentation. Thank um, you. Thank you. And I, I, I have an appointment at 3, but I just had to um, ask, um, as much as I loved, you know, seeing women that I've never heard of before, too, mm -hmm. that was really helpful. You forgot Nancy Pelosi. I did. What I wanted to say also was, especially with Hillary, Nancy, some other um, uh, prominent uh, women politicians, talk about the kind of price they really had to pay. Yeah, you know, I agree. Now, um, yes. This would be quite frightening to a young woman who might want to get into politics. Yes. She's very opinionated and, mm -hmm. and with you know strong a strong uh, outlook. It's really, yeah. you know, it, it's really not so easy. You're right. You're absolutely right. I, I even, I have a hard time even, because I've been invited to different venues. Um, some of them, we've, we've performed for the Daughters of the American Revolution. Unfortunately, we had to take Hillary out of that because they had some strong feelings about it. Um, I, I try, you know, I feel like this information is so important. We try to include as many women as we can. I always put Hillary in there. Because um, she has some major accomplishments, and young girls should look up to her. Uh, and Kamala, I feel like that's kind of almost even on the edge, but I just feel it's worth mentioning, and you're absolutely right. Nancy, I'm a fan of Nancy Pelosi, and she should be included. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's disturbing to watch this on television, all this. It's crazy. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. I want to ask um, with all of this pushback that we're getting, uh, with the black history in textbooks and uh, boards of education saying, no, we cannot make the white people feel ashamed or, mm -hmm. or bad. Do uh, you get any pushback that you know, we're blaming the men and are the men going to be upset with this? Any pushback with putting women into the textbooks? Uh, no, actually we haven't. Um, but. What we were told when we were going to go to Sacramento <laughs> was that that's an uphill battle. Um, now, I will give credit to the State Board of Education is they are including um, more ethnic studies and LGBTQ, which is great. But we don't know how many of those people are represented as women. So, you know, there we are. But yeah, I, I expect pushback, but we haven't received it as of yet. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I could clone you. <laughs> the question that I had, you mentioned in your comments that you're interested in backstories. Mm -hmm. And as I'm watching these faces evolve, I'm thinking, is, is there anything that you're aware of that is a commonality in either their backgrounds or their temperaments, particularly the ones way, way, way back, to fight against all these things? Is there any commonality that you found looking at the backgrounds? What I noticed was their persistence and bravery. And it, it, it touches my soul to know that these women who came before us, what they had to go through, um, especially the suffragettes. And I grew up in the 1970s, and I also remember, now my mom was a Democrat. And I remember watching on television the women marches in the 70s. 
Women's, Revolu Women's Liberation Movement. And I remember thinking, how cool, I want to go march. And my mother's response, and this is a Democrat, said, oh no, those women are giving women a bad name. So that's what I grew up with. And, but I still so much wanted to be part of their crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. If you, by the way, if you want the key to the quiz, I have them. Thank you.